Well, it's my pleasure to be here this morning, and if you'll indulge me, I'm not going to put my suit jacket on. Uh, I said when I left AEP in 2002, I was not going to buy another white shirt or put a tie on, but uh, I'll, I'll put the tie on. Uh, also, uh, this front row over here is, is, is the paid staff that, 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 that came in. Uh, our Sunday school teacher is here. Uh, and if you don't think there's pressure when your Sunday school teacher's uh, in the class and you're talking about ethics, and, and my wife uh, also uh, organized all that. But what I want to do today is talk a little bit uh, about leadership ethics, uh, and then hopefully we'll have some time uh, at the end. There are copies of the slides uh, if you would like those. And if you want a copy, uh, electronic copy, if you'll just uh, email Debbie, uh, because I've added a few slides uh, to what's uh, in, in the handout. But I wanted to start out and uh, share with you my journey uh, of why I'm here today uh, talking about uh, ethics. Uh, those of you that know me, uh, particularly my neighbor next door, uh, that my license plate on my car says ethics, uh, when I'm reminded many times uh, about that. But this all started uh, back in uh, 1991, 1992. Not that I wasn't ethical before then, uh, but, but, but th th this really uh, piqued my interest, uh, and I have spent a lot of time uh, since the, the mid-90s, early 90s. Uh, and it all goes back to, to a federal uh, crime control act uh, that was passed in 1984 uh, by Congress. Uh, and what precipitated the uh, crime act was that there was a disparate sentencing across the United States. Uh, if you committed a crime uh, in New York uh, and you committed a crime in California, uh, you might get two times the sentence in New York you got in California uh, or vice versa. So, so Congress passed uh, the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1984 uh, with the purpose of homogenizing sentencing across the United States. So similar crimes, you, you got similar uh, penalties in the various states. But it did another very, very important thing. And if you look here, uh, permits an organization to receive these penalties with the exception of imprisonment. Uh, and it, it applied to any federal law if you broke it. So not only did you have the civil individual penalties, organizations were also subject to the same penalties other than that they couldn't sentence because an organization uh, is an organic body, uh, but there's no one person uh, that, that, that would, would be subject to the penalties or, or, or the uh, uh, imprisonment. The, the, the people could be imprisoned, but you can't imprison uh, an organization. But also what, what the act did is that it provided incentives for organizations that exhibited good ethical behavior. Uh, and it laid out seven guidelines that if an organization developed a compliance and ethics program that met these guidelines, these seven guidelines, your penalty could be reduced. Uh, and your penalty could be reduced significantly if you had a comprehensive ethics program. Uh, the classic example uh, is Sears. As you know, Sears has an automotive section. A and they came out with a program to, to, to sell more batteries and, and more brakes, and they incentivized their mechanics if they sold brakes and sold batteries. Uh, and as I've said before, when you incentivize somebody to do something, particularly with cash, they're going to do it. Uh, and then they brought a class action suit against Sears for replacing brakes that weren't needed to replace, replacing uh, tires that didn't need to be replaced. Uh, and Sears settled the class action suit, but they were uh, investigated and fined by the federal government in the area of something like $90 million. And because they had a comprehensive ethics program that met these seven criteria, uh, that fine was reduced down into to less than, I think it was like $12 million. 
but they had to have a comprehensive program. So there was great incentives for corporations to establish a, a comprehensive compliance and ethics program. And in, in the, these guidelines came out in 1991, November, and I was asked by AEP to establish our compliance program at AEP. So we set out to do that, and I think we got it up and running uh, in 1993, 1994. Uh, and I had responsibility for that uh, until I retired in 2002. And as such, uh, became very, very committed uh, to ethics, ethical leadership. And if you look at 1994, this is from the Ethics Resource Center. In 1994, now this is three years after they became effective, uh, there was only 37% of all organizations that taught ethics. And I would guess that if you went back three years, this would be less than 37%. But you can see in the latest survey that ERC conducted, it's now 81%. And they do the survey every two years, and my guess is when it comes out in 15, that'll be up in the 90%, 90% area. Uh, because all organizations essentially today uh, have some form of ethics. Well, what is ethics? The best definitions uh, that I've come across uh, are these two. Uh, both happen to be from Ohio. Uh, Tim Smucker gave a talk on ethics uh, at Chautauqua uh, a few years back. Uh, and in his talk, he said that ethics is doing the right thing even when no one is looking. Uh, and I use the example, if you're in the middle of uh, nowhere, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and the light's red, can't see a car for miles around, do you wait till the light turns green to go? That's a measure of your ethics. I wait. I, 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 unless you're turning right now. You, 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 you. <laughs> and, and then uh, my former colleague uh, at AEP uh, said, doing the right thing the first time every time. Uh, both of these statements are very plaudible. But the question is, what's the right thing? Uh, and that's where you come in, that's where leadership comes in, uh, in determining what is the right thing. In determining what is the right thing, there's two components of ethics. There, there's <laughs> compliance ethics, and there's aspirational ethics. And we'll start with compliance ethics, and those are, you hit the wrong button, uh, those are the laws, rules, and regulation, regulations that pertain to your particular uh, profession, to your particular line of work. I don't care what you do. There are laws, rules, and regulations uh, that pertain to that. And the distinction of compliance ethics is they have the force of law. These are things that people who carry badges and handcuffs uh, can literally show up at your front door if you don't adhere uh, to the laws, rules, and regulations. So you have a responsibility. Uh, it's like when you drive your car. You have a responsibility to know the rules of the road. If you're stopped for speeding, you can't say, I didn't know the speed limit. That's not a defense. Because when you get your license, you're certifying that you know the rules of the road and you will comply with them. So the first rule of the right thing uh, is know and follow all laws, rules, and regulations applicable to your chosen field and importantly 24-7. Ethics is not a part-time job. Ethics is a full-time job, uh, and you have to be a, a, applicable 24-7. So the first rule I would leave you with today as a leader uh, is know and follow those laws, rules, and regulations, because you are responsible uh, for knowing them, and you're going to see a little bit later you're responsible uh, for conveying them uh, to your followers, followers uh, to your colleagues. Well, the second part of ethics is aspirational ethics. And aspirational ethics is broken down 
into personal ethics and professional ethics. Uh, and personal ethics are what defines you. Uh, it, it, it's what identifies you of how you conduct yourself uh, on your day-to-day, -day, everyday life, in your interactions, your interpersonal relationships uh, with your friends, uh, colleagues, uh, and, and other professionals. And the second part of aspirational ethics is your professional ethics. Uh, and that's where you must adhere to uh, all the uh, interactions uh, and business dealings uh, in your professional life. So again, aspirational or is, is made up of these two uh, ethics, two, two pieces. And let's talk about personal ethics a minute. You have to decide where you're going to set your ethics bar. That is a personal decision that you have to make. Now, if you look at the continuum from a felony on the left uh, to a Nobel Prize in the middle, somewhere between these two, there's a line between what's illegal and what's legal. Now, hopefully, uh, nobody's going to set their ethics bar in this illegal area. So you have to decide where are you going to set this ethics bar. And a lot of this are, are things that you have, have, have uh, learned uh, from childhood, uh, growing up from your parents. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a believing Christian, and a good basis to start are the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule. Now, I'm not saying about your religion, that's your personal choice. But in my mind, the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule uh, is a very good foundation for setting your ethics bar. Uh, I was a Boy Scout, uh, the, the Boy Scout law, the Girl Scout law, uh, you know, hel helps set uh, your ethics bar uh, of, of where you want to set it. So you have to decide this. Uh, I have chosen, uh, not bragging or anything, but I, I've chosen to set this pretty close to the far right extreme. Some of my CODA colleagues uh, are here, uh, and I know you were there, Amanda. Uh, we'll remember that we had some ethical challenges, uh, and I didn't want to take any risk uh, of, of somebody accusing me uh, of violating some, some rule or regulation. So we moved that bar far right. Uh, and I said one of my first board meetings that I would take nothing from nobody because I just didn't want to have that concern. When I, my wife knows I sleep pretty well. Uh, I, I didn't want to have to think about sleeping. So you as a leader have to decide where is it that you want to set your ethics bar. And in setting your, rep, your, your, your ethics bar, something to think about is your reputation. I often ask classes, what is your most valuable asset? Think about that for a minute. What is your most valuable asset? And a lot of people say their house. And if you look at dollars and cents, that probably is your, your, your largest uh, asset. Uh, uh, some people think their car. But I would contend your most valuable asset is your reputation. And, and Warren Buffett, a, a famous quote, uh, and I'll read it so it, it, everybody can think about it, is it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. I think that is a very, very good quote. Because we can all think of people who have ruined their reputation uh, by a few minutes of, of some action uh, that, that, that should not uh, ha have done. So protect your reputation by setting your ethics bar uh, far uh, to the right. Uh, and the second rule is to set your personal ethics bar high and, again, live it 24-7. Uh, leaders are watched. And, and, and your actions speak more than your words. Uh, it, it, you know, and you can't just do it from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. 
It's got to be a 24-hour, uh, seven basis. Well, the second half of, of aspirational ethics uh, are organizational ethics. And these are many. Uh, I, I can't list them all up here. But many organizations set their organizational ethics uh, through their vision, mission, and value statements. Uh, my colleague David Teed is here. Uh, in, in early on, when he formed Campus Park, uh, he established a vision, mission, values, uh, and post them. And I suspect a lot of you in, in your particular chosen field uh, will have mi vision, mission, and values uh, on the uh, walls or, or in a handbook. And they can't be just words on a piece of paper. Uh, you have to embrace them. Uh, you have to live them. Uh, day in uh, and day out. Uh, codes of compliance. AEP, we had a code of compliance. Uh, at the time I was there, we called it the uh, code of compliance and ethics. Again, compliance is more focused uh, on the various uh, laws, rules, and regulations. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, codes of conduct. Uh, uh, people have codes of conduct. Uh, professional codes of conduct. I'm a professional engineer. Uh, I have a professional code of conduct uh, from the National Society of Professional Engineers, and I have a code of conduct from the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, that I'm expected to live uh, and act uh, every day. Uh, they don't have the force of law, but they have the force of censorship by the organization. Uh, if you're a CPA, uh, if you're a medical doctor, you, you, you have a code of conduct, again, that you're expected to know and adhere to. Uh, past practices uh, can, can establish uh, organizational uh, ethics. Uh, most of you probably don't remember Lazarus, uh, the big department store uh, that used to be downtown. Uh, Lazarus had a policy that you could return anything, and no questions asked, they would either replace it or refund your money. And that was one of the key things about Lazarus, that people went to Lazarus, uh, because they knew that they could count on uh, re recovery uh, or replacement uh, if something uh, di didn't go well, uh, and uh, others uh, as well. So I can't list them all, but again, you can have your own organizational uh, ethics, uh, there are other written uh, ethics uh, codes and, and codes of conduct. An example, uh, and I just have four more examples that I wanted to share with you. Uh, this is from a real company. Uh, this is a vision statement uh, from a real company. Uh, and the hierarchy is vision, mission, values. Uh, Roosevelt had a vision to win the Second World War. Eisenhower had a mission to attack Normandy. And then there, there, there were values. So the vision is a broad statement of where you want to be in the future. Uh, and this is very helpful from an ethical standpoint, but it's very helpful from a leadership standpoint that people know where you want to go. If they don't know where you want to go, they're never going to get there. So, so a vision statement uh, serves uh, two purposes, uh, as do values. Values, uh, uh, in this case, respect. Uh, this is a very laudable value. Uh, you know, we treat each other, others, as we would like to be treated. That's the golden rule. Uh, we do not tolerate abusive or disrespectful treatment. Ruthlessness, callousness, and arrogance don't belong here. A great value in you as if you were an employee of this company uh, or a colleague of this company, uh, you're expected to embrace that uh, value. Uh, integrity. We treat, other, we treat others as we would like to be treated ourselves. We do not tolerate abusive or disrespectful treatment, ruthlessness, callousness, and arrogance don't belong here. 
again, a value of how you as a leader uh, and as an employee uh, are expected uh, to uh, react. Uh, communication. Oops. Communication, uh, also a very, very uh, important value. Uh, and leaders have a responsibility to communicate these values uh, in addition to living uh, these values 24-7. Uh, and then the final one is excellence. Uh, satisfied with nothing less than the very best in everything we do. We will continue to raise the bar for everyone. The great fun here will be for all of us to discover just how good we can really be. So with that vision statement and those value statements, it sets a really, really good picture of the corporate ethics uh, of this real company. So the third rule of uh, ethical leadership uh, is to know or set your own organizational ethics and live them 24-7. Now, this is the third time I said 24-7 to drive home the point that when you're a leader, people are watching you 24-7. I used to tell the CEO of AEP that, that he was watched from the minute he drove into the garage uh, in the morning uh, until he drove out at night. Uh, I, I said, if, if you look mean in the elevator, that's going to impact people during the day. Now, he always looked mean, so I, <laughs> <laughs> he never quite got it uh, from that perspective. But, but true, I can't, I can't emphasize enough. You, you are what? I knew when I was at CODA, when we started to change the culture, uh, to embrace ethics, that they were watching me to see what I was doing. Uh, and if I wasn't living the talk, it was all for naught of, of, of what, what, what I was trying to do. Uh, and I feel comp confident uh, that we were able to change the culture by people embracing uh, our values. We have some CODA folks here. Uh, they're in a class called Leaders of the Future. Uh, and they are bright, up-and-coming uh, stars of, of the future of CODA. Uh, and ethics is a, is a big part. Paul and Debbie uh, actually uh, teach that class at, at, at CODA. So you have to, you have to live the values. And uh, so the, the right thing, when we say do the right thing, even when nobody is looking, uh, is it, made up of compliance ethics uh, and aspirational ethics, and, and that defines uh, what is uh, the right thing. So that gives you the right thing, and then let's look at uh, ethical leadership of what do you do with the right thing once you know what the right thing is. Uh, and doing the right thing, but doing so in a way that encourages others to follow suit. In other words, your values, your ethics uh, should convey uh, to others and that they want to follow you. Uh, and clearly, if, if you have low ethics bar and they have a high ethics bar, they're probably going to disengage and, and, and won't be around. So, so, so you, you, you have to encourage others to follow suit. You have to communicate the importance of ethics. You can't just have it on the wall. Uh, you, know, you just can't have it in a handbook. You've got to talk about it. And if you go back to the slide uh, that showed that the ethics training went from the high teens to the, to the mid-80% shows that people are communicating. Uh, we had annual ethics training at AEP. We had annual ethics training uh, at CODA. Uh, and it should be a continuous communication. You've got to abide by company standards. Uh, 
again, you can't tell the employees to do one thing and you do another because they'll, they'll disengage uh, quickly. You got to support employees uh, in, doing, in doing the right thing uh, through encouragement, uh, through uh, recognition, to recognize uh, when they do the right thing. And equally important is you have to hold them accountable if they don't. One of the seven criteria uh, of a uh, good uh, corporate compliance code of ethics program uh, is to hold accountable uh, employees who violate uh, your ethics uh, and your compliance rules. Uh, and we did that at AEP. Uh, you know, one of the toughest things a leader will do uh, is to discharge an employee. Uh, that's the capital punishment of the work environment. And I always tell people, the day you enjoy discharging an employee is the day you shouldn't be there. But it's a responsibility of, of leaders uh, that you have to take that step if the violation justifies that action. Because that will destroy uh, an organization if people see that they're not held accountable uh, for their actions. Well, who, who are these leaders uh, that, that we talk about uh, in setting the uh, tone, uh, in living it 24-7? Uh, and interestingly, about 40% of the leaders who set the tone are, are, your super, are supervisors not the president, not the board of directors. Almost two-thirds of the people who, who set the tone, the ethics tone, are supervisors and the president uh, and CEO. So all, all leaders, uh, no matter what level, uh, have a part in, in, in setting the tone. Interestingly, uh, and, and this is from the Ethics Resource uh, Center's National Survey of 2013, you hear a lot of talk about the board of directors of a company. And a board of directors is very, very important to the governance of any organization. But when you survey the workforce, only 3% of the people feel that the board sets the tone. So that's the importance of that leadership group from the CEO or from the board uh, down to the first level of supervision. Now I would contend that the board uh, is extremely critical in establishing the tone at the CEO, the CFO, the CIO, uh, and, and other top officers, which then permeate it down through. But what's not on here uh, is the informal leader. Uh, the informal leader uh, is the person that you want to identify if you go in to a, a company uh, to do a turnaround, to do, do a startup, uh, to, to, to continue the operations. Because the informal leader in an organization can have more influence than anybody on this chart. When I went to CODA, uh, I was there about three months and had identified two informal leaders that were instrumental uh, in the changes that we were able to make. Because those are the people that, that, that their colleagues go to when they have an issue uh, or they have a question uh, or, or they need some answer. So uh, supervisors are important. Uh, formal leaders uh, are also important. And they set the tone uh, at the top, the tone of the organization. Uh, and if it's not good ethics, uh, th then you have uh, issues. Now, I said that uh, the 
vision statement uh, and the values was from a real company. And it is. It's actually from uh, a, a, a real company. And how many of you would like to work for this company? Have you seen, just hold your hands up if you like to. Would you all like to work for this company? Well, this company uh, revised uh, their code last uh, in July of 2000. Uh, and in August of 2000, uh, their stock uh, on the New York Stock Exchange was selling for $90.75. With that values and vision statements, anybody want to speculate on what their stock is today? How many think it's more with that value statement? That is the uh, vision and values from Enron that was revised in July 2000. And the key takeaway is if you don't walk the talk, it's all for naught. So no matter how good the statements are, if you don't live them 24-7, you're going to end up like Enron and bankrupt. So I'll conclude. Uh, with, with uh, this statement, uh, and this was taken out of the latest report uh, by the Ethical uh, Resource Center, that ethical leadership is increasingly a round-the-clock job, 24-7. When it comes to ethics, everything a leader does sets a tone. Back to my statement to the CEO of AEP, that he's watched 24-7. In a world where old distinctions between public and private are increasingly blurred, leaders' private behavior can matter just as much as what they do at work. So when you're at the grocery store or you're in a restaurant, uh, your followers are, are, are watching you. When leaders practice 24-7 integrity, Workers' own commitment to ethical conduct tends to be stronger. In matters of ethics, leaders are always setting the tone. Uh, I will mention, and I'm not promoting books, uh, don't get any benefit off of them, uh, but uh, this book, True North, uh, by Bill George, uh, is an excellent, easy read on leadership ethics. It is one of the best uh, that I've seen lately. It's, it's fairly new, uh, so if, if you want a book. So with that, uh, I think we have some time for questions. I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions. If, if, if uh, I can't answer them, uh, uh, David Abel, the, the leader of our Sunday school class, will be, be, be happy to jump up and fill in anything that can't be answered. Yes? Okay, you, when you were talking about Sears Automotive and you said how their incentives um, incentivize employees to, for in, unethical behavior, have you found companies that have been able to incentivize ethical behavior? Um, how do they, they frame that reward to keep their employees from doing the right thing every time? The, uh, uh, let me just answer your first part on the, the, the Sears uh, uh, issue. Whenever you create an incentive program, you have to brainstorm the program uh, and try to determine what are the unintended consequences of the program. Uh, in Sears' case, it was the mechanics were replacing stuff that didn't need to be done. Uh, when we first went to incentive compensation at AEP, it was brand new to us. Uh, so in the great wisdom of the office of the chairman, where all knowledge is retained, we decided that we're going to say, if you can cut your budget 
2%, we're going to give you a cash incentive, significant cash incentive. And lo and behold, what happened? Budgets got cut 2%. Five years later, our outages started going up dramatically. How did they cut their budget? They stopped cutting trees. And if you don't cut a tree, it's going to grow up and get into the line. So back to your question of how do you incentivize uh, 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 good behavior, uh, in, I don't have a great crisp answer for that, uh, but y you have to be aware and monitor what's going on. And when you find uh, egregious action, you have to take action. Now, we were very careful uh, at AEP and at CODA that when we discipline somebody for ethical misbehavior, uh, we didn't put that in the bulletin, on the bulletin board. Uh, we, we tried to contain it just for their own benefit because then they can, can, can correct their actions. But sometimes you, you have to take the action of a discharge in the informal network that they know all about that. But the only, th the only thing I would say is, is, is brainstorm the incentive before and then monitor uh, what, what, what's going on. Uh, Sears should have been monitoring better their, their tire replacement and, and their brake and battery replacement. But that's, that's, a, that's a, a good question because it's, it's really a hard, an, hard one to answer. Uh, but that's why, as leaders, you have to walk around uh, and, and see, see what's going on. I think part of that, too, is, is hiring the right people within a You do have a way in your recruiting process to determine the right fit for your culture once you had determined this is how you, know, you were going to lead your organization? Yes. Uh, if you look at these seven uh, criteria, uh, uh, do care in delegating substantial discretionary uh, in authority. Uh, we had a uh, program uh, where we did uh, background checks uh, on uh, everybody that, that that, that we were hiring. We also uh, went to uh, team interviewing, where instead of just the HR being involved, the, the, the department head and, and, and some workers uh, in the particular area to try to get a good feel uh, for uh, the culture uh, of the employee. Uh, I, and John, I'm not a big fan on check in with previous employers uh, because the federal government has, has, has really made it so onerous that all you can say is they worked here from this date to that date. And you're not going to get good information in my opinion. So you've got to do it through the interview process and half the time you're going to fail. Uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, it's about 50% uh, of people that don't, don't work out at the, at the higher levels. But that's one of the criteria that you have to, ha have to take the necessary steps uh, b before you uh, assign somebody uh, discretionary authority. Bill, hey, um, you got a uh, licensed insurance broker in Ohio, and in order for me to keep my license, I have to take <coughs> three hours of continued education of, for ethics. Are there other companies that are required to take uh, the, the, yes, uh, the uh, professional engineers uh, in a lot of the states, not, uh, coincident, not Ohio, uh, require that you take two hours of ethics every two years uh, to c keep your, your professional engineer's license. Uh, the Ohio General Assembly uh, is in the process of drafting a law that Ohio will institute a requirement uh, for professional engineers. Uh, lawyers, you must have a lawyer in here. How many? Uh, two. Two. Uh, law lawyers, uh, CPAs, anybody CPA? Tell us how many hours. I think four hours every three years. Yeah. So a, a lot of a, a profession, this goes back to the profession 
uh, codes of conduct and, and, and requirements. Uh, uh, engineers have 15 hours uh, every year, 30 hours over two years, uh, but there's not a piece has to be ethics yet, but it's coming. Now, the state requires us to take the, the ethics courses. Does the state require states to take ethics courses? The, the, the uh, Ohio Ethics Commission uh, is a fine, fine uh, body, uh, and they require that you have to take so many hours of ethics training uh, every year. Uh, when I was on the uh, uh, Board of Building Appeals. Uh, every year I had to go to two hours of ethics training, and that's tracked. Uh, at CODA, we, we had, I don't know what you have now, but uh, we had a, a minimum of an hour. Uh, we required our board to take ethics training uh, every year uh, at AEP. Again, because the, the training uh, is, uh, I'm going to find it here. Uh, somewhere in there, it's about training. But that, uh, to have a good corporate compliance program under the United States Sensing Guidelines, you have to, you have, to have ethics training. Uh, and we documented it. Everybody had to sign uh, a statement. Well, uh, uh, piggybacking on the, the notion of additional training uh, on ethics in the business environment, what about the educational environment? You know, you mentioned the future leaders of America. When I think about the students who are role and goal oriented, uh, whose only thought is, I shouldn't say their only thought, but in thinking profits first, ethics second. So any wisdom to share with students who might be here, young leaders who might be here, educators who might be here, as to how to hone their eyes a, a, a little bit tighter to think about e e ethics and their decision making? <laughs> Well, that's a tough question, too. <laughs> Somebody got an easy question. Uh, the, the, I, I talk to a lot of, a lot of student classes, uh, and I always talk about the reputation that, uh, you know, students, it's been eons since I've been a student. Uh, I should let Paul talk about this. Uh, but they're invincible. Uh, nothing's ever going to affect them. Uh, but they, they, they need to, to, to realize that ethics uh, is a key part of their life uh, and that they can damage their reputation uh, if they put profit uh, before ethics. Enron is bankrupt because they put profit above ethics. Uh, one of the things that, that I like what Ohio State and the Fisher College does, that when the new class comes in, uh, they have an ethics seminar and then they all sign a statement uh, that they will abide by the, the rules and, uh, of the college, uh, and then they put it up on the wall with everybody's signature uh, on it. But I, I don't have any silver bullets other than that ethics should be a part of every class. Uh, I'm not a proponent of just going to an ethics class and you check the box and you're done. It's got to be in, in embedded. Uh, in, in every class and, and make, hopefully, them see the importance of their reputation and how that can damage their reputation. Um, I, I teach nursing and um, we do a lot of ethics kind of discussions and the, one of my classes I was trying to teach them the concept of what is a sentinel event. And I said, well, let's look at sentinel events in your lives. And I said, how about 9-11? And they were in first grade when that happened. And it's a big lesson for us when we teach that if we want to teach something like ethics and the impact of unethical behavior, um, we have to find what's happened within their <laughs> lifetime within particularly high school years or early college years, what impacted them? Because our examples hold no water. That you know, even Enron or whatever, whatever year that was, they made right, and and I even said, I said, well, what about the airplane that just went into the French Alps? 
and that, and they looked at me, and it had happened last week, and it had been headline news for a week. And I said, you don't listen to the news, do you? And they don't. So it's very <coughs> difficult for them to find who are your leaders, who are the people you hold up as your role models, what impacts your life and the life of you, your, you know, your daily walk. I find it very, very challenging because their world is their little bubble and they can Twitter and talk all they want, but they don't really look beyond their tiny little bubble. Great point, great point. Uh, just a little humor story, and Paul's going to, because I always misquote it, and Paul reminds me, but I, I was teaching a uh, business class uh, at Ohio State a few years back, uh, and we were talking about planning. And I said, General Eisenhower said that uh, planning is everything, but plans are worthless. And a student raised his hand. He said, who is General Eisenhower? <laughs> So that, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I have an excellent point. I want to kind of piggyback on a couple of thoughts there. One of the things that has come about has been social media and the blurring of the lines of how one's reputation is in light of social media. And for many younger folks, it's within that social media bubble or sphere. Within a company, many people are also, in a very informal way, engaging in social media. And so the lines between supervisor and supervisee, I guess, um, are blurred. So from an ethical standpoint, is there a, has there been a rise in the blurring of those lines? And then how does social media either accentuate or highlight the challenges of ethics in the business world? I, I, I don't know whether, I've not seen any surveys on what social media has done of that line between the supervisor and, uh, and the employee. So I, I, I really, I'd be asked if anybody else has any thoughts uh, on that question. Uh, uh, social media has changed a lot. Uh, no, no, no question about that. Uh, in digressing slightly, uh, that has a big impact on reputation. How many times have we read about somebody doing something on social media? But I don't know. I don't have any any good thoughts for you on, on, on that blurring. I think that just might underscore Bill's point to twenty four seven that if your associate doesn't respect a supervisor as they did traditionally, mm -hmm. um, the supervisor needs to emphasize ethics that much more because they don't have kind of that yes sir yes ma'am respect in the morning work. Good point. One example is uh, I have 35 agents selling insurance for me. And uh, when you sell an insurance policy, there's a lot of variables to it. And depending on what the variable is, depends on how much commission you make as the agent. And I always said, if you're looking at how much money you're going to make and on a particular product, then you're in the wrong business. You've got to look at what's best for the client, and that's what's best for your pocketbook. That, that's an excellent point, Rich. I'm a FINRA arbitrator as well, uh, and we deal with that where people are selling products because their commission's higher, not what's best for the, for the customer. And your obligation is to the customer. This is kind of two parts. Uh, one is, do you have any uh, examples that uh, legal um, might not be ethical? Um, and I have an example that it's not really fuzzy to talk about, but. Um, that would be basically put up to the public perception if it ever did go to, but I never get caught on. But so, do you have any examples of a, a legal, ethical, like what's ethical and what may even not be legal to do? I'm talking about the medical world. I'm a paramedic firefighter. Okay, yeah, you're in a, a whole different uh, arena. Uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have any examples in the medical. Uh, an example. It, it ended up being okay, but we have um, we have DNRs that everybody, most people know about. And um, you have to legally have those with you all the time if, if you want us to, to abide by those. And we, I had personally had an issue with a, a person that was um, wanted her mother to not have, be resuscitated, and she did not have that with her. And I was in a position where I had to make a decision to try to abide by what the daughter wanted and what I legally have to do. And I walked a very fine line, and, and obviously would have been 
could have called, been called the carpet and said, hey, you know, you didn't do this properly. And who knows what would have happened to me. But it ended up being okay because she that's what she wanted. It was truly, she did have a DNR, just didn't have it with her. But where does that, you know, I mean, I, I get a reputation that I'm, you know, I'm going to do, but I always try to go on the right side, what is right at the moment. And I know there's things that, well, what if the, the son of the, the mom didn't want that to happen? You know, they wanted to keep her alive or, you know, at least what ifs. But, you know, how do you, I mean, is my, is my compass right or is it wrong? But, I mean, I don't, you know, I kind of struggle with this a little bit because we had another incident, not me personally, but I just know about an incident recently of medics have now, this is not, I don't know them personally, but, you know, where we had uh, women who are, pregnant nine months and they are going they're dying they're dead they're, you know we CPR is going to keep them alive and you know, I've heard of medics you know doing emergency c-section which is not in our spoke of practice but if you do not the baby's dead so you have this little compass there that's like legally can't ethically we've all I've seen it we, we, we're not trained to do it but we're, we've seen it we know how it works so what do you <laughs> I commend you for what you do. You, 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 you have to make decisions instantly. You, you, you can't contemplate it for the next 20 minutes. Uh, so I commend you uh, for what you do. Uh, and you have to have your true north, your compass, uh, and, and, and abide by it. Uh, an example I can give you uh, is that uh, I, I was teaching an engineering class, uh, and it was forensic engineers. And, and forensic engineers go around the country uh, and investigate accidents, uh, uh, buildings falling down. And they had their conference uh, down in Miami, their annual conference. Uh, and three of the forensic engineers were coming back from lunch, none of them in the state of Florida. Uh, and engineers cannot practice engineering in a state they're not licensed. Uh, you, you, you can be censored by the board. Uh, and as they're coming back from lunch, they notice that there's a big scaffolding on a building. And just because of their engineering mentality, they knew that it was wrong and potentially could fail. And if it failed with, with all the traffic, there could be deaths and, and, and serious injury. Uh, they instantly made a decision that they were going to go to the contractor and advise the contractor that the scaffolding was not properly installed, which they did. Uh, but they knew when they did it that that contractor could file a claim against them for practicing engineering without a license. Uh, but they chose, because the, the, the engineering codes, the number one code is to hold paramount the health, safety, and welfare of the public. That trumps everything else in the code. Because there's conflicts within the code. You, you can't just look at one section, you've got to look at all of them. But that trumps everything. And they made, I, my view, they made the right decision, but knowing there would be some potential consequences. Uh, and, and again, I, uh, I would not want to be in your shoes because uh, you've got to make these decisions quick, but you have to have your true north. That's what this talks about your compass, a true north, uh, and your principles and values that you will not compromise. But again, I. But it just seems like the, the, the administration or anybody, a person who's not in the situation at the time, um, can look at it as black and white. They well, broke the law, that's the way it is, you chose your path, go find another career. <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's the traditional Monday morning quarterbacking. That, that, you know, in the comfort of your office, with all the time you need, you can say that was not the right thing to do, but they weren't on the front line. Mentioned emotionally attached to it. Right, mm -hmm. right. I think it comes down to your willingness to, to answer. I mean, look yourself in the mirror every morning. If you're happy with what you see, scroll. <laughs> 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 Is there a question here? <laughs> <laughs> when you look at, at influence and leadership and, and be able to understand as leaders how you can influence other people, you've got to look at who the, like the, the nursing students, who, who do they look at as leaders? I mean, if it's our politicians, we're all in trouble. <laughs> if it's our teachers, then you're on the front line. 
and you have the opportunity to influence because if they're looking at Katy Perry or Rihanna, then we're even in worse shape than the politicians. One final question. I bet he's got the book here. <laughs> what, what should a leader do if you, you talk about aspirational ethics, particularly professional ethics? What should, should a leader do if they have a conflict between their professional ethics and the organizational ethics? That, that, is, that, that is a very, very difficult question to answer. Uh, you, you have to decide where your line in the sand is. Uh, and if your personal ethics are in conflict with your corporate ethics, you have to decide, am I going to, well, number one, you should try to get the corporation to see it your way if you, if you can, to change it. But if you can't, you have to make the decision then uh, of, of, of what you want to do. Uh, I was on a committee to draft a paper uh, for the NSPE uh, which dealt with that very same question uh, of what particularly do young engineers do when their corporate ethics are in conflict with their personal ethics. Because again, it, it, it comes to the ultimate decision of are you going to sever that relationship. But I always say try to resolve it internally first to, to, to change it uh, to, to where you can, you can live with it. Because if you can't live with it, there's probably others out there that can't live with it too. But these are neat. Ethics is not easy. And ethics is not cheap. Because sometimes you have to make decisions that, that, that are financially uh, disadvantaged. But when you don't do that, it's when you're going to end up like Enron uh, and not be around. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you.